Thank you very much. I am not going to do it from up there, and I'm going to do it from out here. And that's why I was asking you what you thought. And Ruslan, if you're backstage, I want you to know that the two women I was sitting with very much approve what you had to say. I'm going to try to provide you with as much information as I can in as little amount of time. I urge you, get out your notebooks, get out your iPhones. If you have a Blackberry, throw it away, because it doesn't work. <laughs> and I want to try to give you the messaging and the language. And the first thing I want to do, and I need to do it quickly, because I'm looking up there and I realize just how fat I am. <laughs> you promised me you were going to give me the slimming camera. I want to show you one of the great ads, one of the great ads for charter schools of all time because it aired this year. As Ruslan says, you're at the forefront of this. You're the foot soldiers, and I don't like using that war analogy, but you're the ones who make this thing happen. And I want you to know that you've got air cover. I do something that's called instant response, and people react on a second-by-second -second basis, word by word visual by visual, I want you to see the best ad for charter schools that I have seen in a long, long time. The higher that the lines climb, the more favorable it is. If it goes above a 50, it's good. If it goes above a 60, it's great. If it goes above a 70, it's amazing. Let's take a look at how to communicate charter schools. Awesome. Amazing. Because the language works. And what I'd like to do now is show you some of that language. Let's pull up the PowerPoint and let's see how many slides I can get through in the limited time that I have. Because this is the reason to put up the PowerPoint so that you stop looking at me, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, this is like my better side. Thank God. I, t I said that everyone should have uh, like uh, plastic bags, so just in case you had to look at me, you could at least cover yourselves up. Let's go to, oh, by the way, take a look at the website, lunsglobal.com. Here's my deal. If you want this PowerPoint, you have to sign up for one of my focus groups. I do them for CBS News. I do them for Fox News. I do them in business. We're doing one on education that's going to appear on Charlie Rose in July. I want you to sign up, and in return, I'll give you the language that I'm about to show you. So you have to go to lunchglobal.com to sign up. Everybody, hopefully you've got it written down. Next slide. Oh, I've got the, I got the cue right here. Let's talk about where we stand. Let's go. One of the saddest things, and you need, this is part of understanding communication. Watch this. And you in the front are going to want to look in the back as I do this. How many of you overall are better off? Better off than your parents were when they were your age. Raise your hands if you're better off than your parents and keep your hands up, look around. Okay, now put them down. Now tell me truthfully, how many of you believe that your kids will be better off than you? Not that you want them to be. Who by show of hands believe your kids will be better off than you when they get to be your age? A lot fewer hands go up. You wanna grab people's attention you want to own them for five minutes so they're listening to you, these are the two best questions to ask. Because they cut to the core of what we are speaking of, which is a better future. If a mom believes that their kids aren't going to be better off than her, it affects how she looks at life. And it's heartbreaking. It's an direct attack on the American dream. And so you begin with those two questions, and it changes the entire context. Everybody's looking at the future. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm pushing this button, and it's taking you guys a little bit too long to switch slides. Are things for America ever going to get better? One of the key communication principles isn't what you say, 
It's what you ask. Asking the right questions generates the best responses. So we wanted to know what questions do Americans ask. And more than anything else, the top two of the top three, are things for America ever going to get better and will America be the same country 20 years from now? And the answer to number one and number three, are you in this room? The answer to number one and number three de depends on what we do in education. So I am desperate for us. It's, it's, it's the Jewish form of communication, always asking questions. My, I'm Jewish. My, that's not supposed to be a joke, by the way. <laughs> that is the first time in my life I've ever said I'm Jewish and people have laughed. Who here is Jewish? Raise your hands if you're Jewish. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> have you not learned anything from history? Every time someone has asked that question, it hasn't worked out for us. <laughs> Did you see the movie? Our character doesn't make it to the end. <laughs> when I was a kid, I would, I would ask my mother, how far is the earth from the sun? And her answer would be, how far do you think it is? Which is why we're all neurotic. We never actually get an answer. <laughs> but this is how we learn. If we're declarative, if we tell people, they're going to sit like you are right there. This guy's gotten, he's, he, his legs are moving up like this, and he's got his arms so tightly folded because he's still hostile to what I'm saying. But if I ask him, maybe he'll open up. Maybe he'll be more forthcoming. Are you a principal? No. Nope. What do you do? President. You're president of? Charter School. Charter school. I feel sorry for those kids. <laughs> They're doing great. Are you really tough on them? Not necessarily. Uh, so you show them your heart. Oh, absolutely. You show them your heart. And, and do you spend all day walking around like this? Uh, no, it's usually a little bit warmer where I am. Oh, it's warmer where you are. Why? We're, we're... Air, air is not like oh, I get it. So you're, you're too cold in here. Oh, so you're actually cold. <laughs> I understand. Well, if you wore natural fibers instead of polyester, you'd be warmer. <laughs> anyway, in addition, to the right questions. I want to change your language. Stop talking education reform. I hear that everywhere. I hear that in all the communication. You talk about education reform, you talk about better schools. Stop. It's effective education. Education reform is process. Better schools are process. Effective education for everyone is the result. If we're going to survive and thrive, we have to get the words right. And we have to focus on what the overall messaging is. And this is the single best sentence that we have come up with. Because it reaches every student. An effective education that prepares students for success in college, career, and life. Why? Because not every child wants to go to college. Because in the end, if you just have this intellectual capability without knowing how to function, it's not as effective. I want to reach every mom and dad, regardless of what they want for their children. College and career reaches 100% and life is for everybody. And this, in the end, is what education is all about. And I want you to see the numbers behind it because everything I tell you has been researched has been dialed, has been polled. Look at the one that's at the bottom. Modern schools with technology and innovation. The lowest priority. We're not interested in education in terms of innovation if they don't even teach the basics. We want our kids first to be able to read and write and add and subtract. Innovation is good, but not if we haven't achieved the basics. And so what does the best? Real life. Think critically, communicate effectively, and accomplish real-world achievements more than everything else up there. <coughs> this is language that works. Another example. What do you want for public schools? Whoops, let's go back one. Effective, motivating, and challenging. Look at what comes in at the bottom. Cutting edge. Innovation. Even forward thinking. Effective, motivating, and challenging are the words that work. Because what parents see in that is a child that's inspired and a child that aspires to do better. Cutting edge and innovative is about the school. 
Effective, motivating, and challenging is about the child. We need to be about the child, not the school. Here are your 21 words, and if you guys want to take a picture of this, I really don't want those who oppose charter schools to get this, because I frankly don't want them to have the lexicon, but I want you to have it. And I'll do a few of these words up here. You cannot be a great country without great schools. It's a simple declarative statement that everyone agrees with. And it's one of the most powerful statements in the charter movement. Genuine accountability, because we believe that that's the number one attribute necessary for quality education, and we think it's missing in the traditional public school. Intellectually challenging, because we want our students to raise their expectations and raise their game, not lower it to the lowest common denominator. Problem solving and critical thinking so that it goes beyond just what we learn in math and science and American history. Problem solving and critical thinking communicates to them that their children are going to be well-rounded and well-prepared for the future. Uh, Real-world situations, because in the end we don't want, we don't respond to the abstract. We want actual reality. And one more, which is student engagement. What is the most, what is the best example of education failure? I'm going to ask this row right here. If I wanted to take a picture as she looks away, if I wanted to take a picture, show a visual of education failure, what is the best example? What would you guess? You have no idea. Are you, by the way, are you a teacher? and you don't know what failure looks like? What would you say? This is not good. I hope that you're... Say it again. Students in rows. I want failure. What, what is failure? He's got it. Good for you. Are you a teacher? Principal. Okay, you used to get me in trouble all the time. All you teachers in here, I cannot thank you enough. All you principals in here, get out. <laughs> Actually, where are my teachers? Raise your hand if you're a teacher. We can't, th you know that nationwide, the two people who we respect most, and I'm not saying that we actually deliver, but the groups that we respect most are our service men and service women who come back here and don't have a job, and the teachers who work long hours and don't get the proper compensation for it. And so we can't thank you enough for what you do. But he's right. <laughs> but you're a teacher. I want you to be engaged. I want you to be passionate. I want you not to look away from me and get nervous. You're in front of the classroom. You're in front of kids. You are so lucky. You are, we are blessed to have you. And what a wonderful job. But you got to engage them. And what this gentleman said, the number one example of failure, is the kid with his head down on the desk, bored. And that's why that idea of engagement, student engagement, is so important. Some more words for you. Next slide. 14 specific phrases to help you get to where you're going. Standing up for our students, which is one of the songs in here. It is a visual. When you say stand up for them, it actually, they think of it visually. That's how you fight for them. A genuine commitment to our children, our schools. Okay, clearly the teachers' union is affecting that middle thing right there. <laughs> Randy Weingarten is playing around with the uh, keyboard. Uh, genuine commitment to our children, our schools, and our future. Commitment. By the way, in it is legal in Nevada to smoke marijuana. That is why you don't want to smoke marijuana. <laughs> Uh, a genuine commitment. It is not a promise. It is not a pledge. A commitment says it's your reputation. A commitment says that you are serious about what you're doing. A commitment communicates an emotional attachment that cannot be broken. Number three, I've heard advocates talk about winners and losers. 
That's not what parents want to hear. Parents want to ensure that every child is a winner. If they hear the phrase winners and losers, it actually turns them off because to them they think that their child might be that loser. And that's what charter schools do. There are no losers in charter schools. Everybody, virtually everybody succeeds in a charter school, and that's the distinction. Dollars that go straight to the classroom, you know that there's far more accountability in where the money is spent in a charter than there is in a traditional public school. And it's not just accountability in the classroom, it's accountability to how money is spent. Look at number eight there. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't, change it. If it fails, close it. We embrace accountability, but we also embrace action. And that idea where you're willing to put yourself on the line, which a traditional public school isn't, that message to parents says that you're good of heart, that your intent is correct, and that the outcome will be positive. The one at the bottom, every student deserves an effective education. You know that that idea deserves, how powerful that is. When you say that every child deserves a safe classroom, every child deserves a teacher who knows how to impart knowledge and information, every time you put it in the perspective of every child deserves, you are empowering not just the child, but also the parent. And it's one of the most effective linguistic tools. Let's go to the next one. I want to give you two facts that stand out more than anything else. We looked at 25 different facts on education, and I'm looking for things that grab attention. This one more than anybody else. It's not that 70% can't read at an eighth grade level. It's that if you can't read at an eighth grade level, you're never gonna catch up. If you fall behind, that affects your entire life. And that fact stands out more than anything else that we have tested. And here's one other fact. Next slide. The fact that we lose 1.1 million kids every year. But then you embellish, you explain it, you add to it, you enhance it with a child dropping out every 29 seconds or 6,000 who drop out every single day because the schools aren't working. You have to have numbers behind this. You can't just make assertions. There have to be facts. Next slide. And I'm sorry that we're not doing, normally I'm interacting. Normally I'm taking questions as I do this, but I have little time and a lot of material. Next slide. So when you're talking about charter schools, the three most powerful points, effective, motivating, and challenging. When you're talking about students, not, Parents want their child to be inspired more than any other attribute because they believe that if their child is inspired, there will be no limits on their child's future. And that word stands out more than anything else. In terms of content, back to the basics. This is the one that I'm sure people in this room hate. But the problem is parents don't believe their kids are learning the basics. Employers know that their kids aren't learning the basics. And so that's why this does so well. I, I hate presenting it to teachers because they want to do so much more. But there are too many schools that aren't even achieving that, which is why it's such a high priority. In terms of what we want from parents, involved and supportive. We believe that the more involved and supportive parents are, the better the educational life of their children. And we also know the reality that in some households, their children come home and there's no one asking them about their homework. There's no one asking them about what happened in school. One of the great distinctions of charter schools is that parents are directly involved. They participate. They are partners with teachers. And teachers and principals are partners with each other. And everyone is working to the same goal. That's why this language of involved and supportive is so important. And by the way, how many of you got kids between the ages of 12 and 18? Raise your hands. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, and I hope that I'm here. If I'm walking this area, remind me, because when I get to my end, I want to tell you about your own kids and how to ensure that they are happy and healthy, drug-free and alcohol-free, because you're all of the right age. So get my attention before I walk off. And that last thing is the curriculum, intellectually challenging and balanced. For those of you who run charter schools, this is your lexicon. 
These are the words that your students and their parents, not your students, the parents want to hear. Please communicate in that language. Next, in terms of how we talk about the overall value of charter schools, even though we talk about school choice, in the end, what they really want is opportunity. <clears throat> and charter schools offer more opportunities for more students and more families. Choice has been poisoned in the political spectrum. Opportunity is still powerful in an overall framing. Next. So if I could offer you the statement, in essence, the 30-second message. Notice up there, it begins with every child. It's not all, it's every. All is a group, and so it's impersonal. Every is each individual child themselves. That's how careful we are with the language. So every child means every child, no matter what their background, no matter what their zip code, no matter what their family status, every child. And you'll get over 80% of Americans who will agree with that. And just as important with every child, then you say every school. And look at the last line in that second line, the last phrase. Period. No excuses. I'm trying to find the language that when they come at you and say that you are the antithesis of public education or that you are denying funds that should go someplace else, the best way to communicate the value of what you do, three words. Is it working? Are the traditional public schools in the Bronx, are they working? The charter schools in New York are. The charter schools in New Orleans, is anyone here from New Orleans? You rock. You guys are the best, what you do. When you consider the political corruption and the games that are played and, and all the horrific consequences of Katrina, and you succeed as you are New Orleans, you deserve our respect for all that you go through. put the slide back up. We know we're failing. We know it. I know. I just don't want me up. By the way, there's, there's only one thing worse than this. Stand up for one second, and you get this. The only thing worse than this, if you can put me back on for one second, is that. <laughs> uh, back up. We know, by the way, this guy goes, oh my God, I can't believe he wore that. Nice suit, by the way. Uh, we know we're failing millions of children. And then that last line, that last phrase, enough is enough. Or do it as a question. When is enough enough? And that's how you get that last line. Every school should provide that level of quality. Americans' children deserve nothing less. You want an elevator pitch. That's it. I'm always asked when I do these presentations, how can I explain this in 30 seconds? That's how you explain it in 30 seconds and people appreciate it and agree with it. Next. So the principles behind charter schools, three attributes. It's the freedom to choose. And by the way, the freedom to choose is the more conservative approach. The equality for every child is the more progressive approach. I love presenting with Ruslan because she takes uh, the center and center left, I take the center and center right, and the amazing thing is, on 95%, we meet in exactly the same place. And there is no other issue like that, but I want you to use both of those, because I want to make sure that every Democrat and every Republican agrees with you. So it's freedom, equality, and that last line, an efficient, accountable use of tax dollars. So the first two are about the child, the third one's about the process. Combine them all, and you've got the case for increasing charter schools. Also, the idea of doing analogies, if you take a look at the one on the right, it's an analogy. Imagine if your child was not getting the right medical care. That doesn't work nearly as well. It's when you talk about the educational impact on the left. But it's better than two to one, people prefer the language. Our kids deserve better education options and our future depends on it. Does better than talking about some esoteric analogy. Be specific. Get to the point, and remember that these are children whose lives are at stake. Oops. 
Now, what are they gonna give you the most hard time over? It takes away funds from public schools. That's why I gave you the phrase, is it working? And the follow-up to that is, shouldn't we be investing? Shouldn't we be committed to education that works? By the way, where are my principals here? I know I give you a hard time because you guys, I mean, I got suspended constantly. I, and, but here's the cool thing. It, it wasn't for fighting. I mean, it was for fighting with teachers. I, I literally, in 11th grade, a teacher is telling me something, and I actually said, you're so full of shit. And I know, I know, I know, my parents were so mad at me. They locked me in my room for about 11 months, almost, <laughs> which is why I ended up like this. I didn't eat for a year, and so then I've been eating ever since. You guys have it, in some ways, the toughest because you're held accountable. You want to take my microphone? No, they told me to come get you. But... Oh, I got to get off? Yeah, gotta get okay, I got to get off. So I want to skip ahead. I just want to show you a couple of visuals. Jump in, and I'll tell you to keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Remember, you can get this. Keep going. Keep going. A couple more. Right there. Go back. This is... This is this is for your communication. This is for your advertising, for those of you who are involved in this. I want you to universalize what charter schools do because it makes it for every child, not just for those who are there right now. I want you to individualize it so that every parent sees their children in that picture. I want you to personalize it so it's about a human component, that it's a real story of a real individual. And I want you to visualize it in your pictures. Move ahead. Another one, another one, another one, right there. We have tested hundreds of pictures. Go ahead on your iPhones and take it because this will give you an example of 10 of them, nine of them that absolutely work. Why? Because there's joy in their eyes, because there's interaction between students and each other. There's interaction between students and parents. You can feel it. Move ahead. Don't use models. The one on the bottom left comes from an ad for a charter school and it's wrong. And everyone sees it and they say, that's not real. I don't trust it. I'm not going to do it. Next. Kids with their hands up is the number one demonstration that education is working. When a child's hand is up, that's communicating success. Next. It's not just mom. It's not just mom, it's dad too. And when dad is engaged in the education of their kids, that's success. One more slide, because I want you to see what failure is. One more. Broken windows, bars, or the child depressed is failure. And I will leave you with this final note, because it's something I hope you teach your parents in the schools that you teach that you help, that you support. The six ways that you will determine whether or not your kids are gonna be uh, alcohol-free, drug-free, happy and healthy. Number one, how often do you have dinner with them? If you have dinner with them five nights a week or more, you are communicating to them that they're the most important thing in your life. If it's two nights a week or less, you're telling them that they don't matter. Number two, how often do you take them to religious services? If they're going weekly, it's I don't care what it is. It's telling them that there's something out there that's more important than they are, and they will behave differently. Number three, how often you check their homework. This is all in order. If you check their homework four nights a week or more, you're communicating that their intellectual development is as powerful as their physical development, and they will do better in school. Number four, do they tell you the truth on where they are on Friday and Saturday night? And do you demand the truth? Because if they will lie to you about who their friends are and what they're doing, they'll lie to you about anything. Number five, do you take a vacation with them for at least a week and you leave this stupid device alone? <laughs> you do not pick this up when they are in your presence or you're communicating to them that whoever is calling is more important than they are. And number six, do they participate in a team sport? Because then they learn about personal responsibility and responsibility to others. I went long, I'm gonna get yelled at when I get back there, so I'm actually afraid to end, but I have to. I hope that this is helpful to you. Go to lunsglobal.com. You'll get the full presentation. And I mean this 
as deeply as I can. There is nothing I will do this year in my life, in the next 365 days, that'll be as important as being here right now. If you ever get the idea of giving up, please call your best friend, ask them to come over and slap you. <laughs> because there is no politician, there is no business person, there is no entertainment person, there is no sports person doing more important work that will have a greater impact on more people than you are. We are, I'm going to get emotional, we are blessed to have you. Thank you all very much.